Are you wondering about B12 deficiency testing and understanding what your B12 levels are? Maybe you've been told that your B12 levels aren't low enough to actually qualify as deficient. My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video we're going to look at what some of the B12 deficiency myths are regarding testing and how to understand basically when your body needs more B12. So if you like this type of information around vitamins, nutrition, etc., click on that like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this one. All right, let's look at some of the B12 deficiency myths that maybe you have heard before. Okay, so today we're going to look at some B12 deficiency myths. And this study here that I'm sharing basically looks at some of these myths from the perspective of both functional assessment and also from, you know, a more standard assessment of B12 deficiency. Before we get into what those myths are and some of the assessment techniques, we want to define a little bit what deficiency is to begin with. And generally speaking, it means not enough, but not enough for what? Not enough B12 for your red blood cells to divide, not enough basically to carry out the natural functions that the body is needing to do on a daily basis. So that definition for deficiency is more of a functional way to look at it. And the reference labs, when you're typically doing a B12 test for deficiency, you're going to do that through a reference lab like SonorQuest or LabCorp, and they're going to define deficiency based on what they've established as a normal and abnormal reference range. So we're looking at this a little bit differently, but you do want to understand how they came up with that reference range to see how it could and or might be flawed. So, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that it is totally flawed. I'm just saying we want to kind of understand where it is they're coming from when we're looking at serum B12 and when it comes up as deficient or adequate. So basically when you're doing uh, any lab that creates a reference range, they basically take, you know, a subset of the population. We'll just for easy numbers, say it's hundred people, and then you're going to average what that of those hundred people, what it is. And then you're going to have so many standard deviations away from that as the low and so many standard deviations away from that as the high. That's kind of how those reference ranges are set up. So if, you know, you have a bunch of people that are deficient, well, that's not going to be a very good way to do that, but that's why you take a large sample to make sure you're accounting for, you know, all subsets of the population. But basically this implies that you are going to miss some people, some of the time with that kind of reference range. And there Therefore, you may miss out on some problems that are occurring from B12 deficiency. And that's true for any serum blood test or any reference range. You, you know, you're know, you going to miss some of the people that actually have the problem when you're looking for deficiency or excess, or et cetera. And uh, that gets at the relative sensitivity of the test. You know, Is it going to pick up all of the, the people that have the problem or is it going to pick up half or, you know, 90% or what is it? So I don't know what the sensitivity is for that for B12, but you get the idea. So when we're looking at myths of B12 deficiency, a lot of them are centered around looking at the test results from a reference lab um, and how you know we interpret them, whether or not we're going to interpret those as gospel, or we're going to dig a little bit deeper and have stricter criteria for what we're considering deficient or not. So this is important for B12 in particular, because some people, it's been noted in case studies and even research that even people with normal serum B12 can have low uh, actual functional B12 when you look at some of the functional assessments in your tissues. All right, so let's look at what some of these myths actually are. And this is from that study that I pointed out here, the many phases of cobalamin deficiency. The first one is you have no anemia. So, you know, some doctors will say, you know, if you don't have anemia, then you don't have B12 deficiency. Well, it takes a lot of B12 deficiency to create anemia, meaning you have to have B12 deficiency for a long time for you to actually stop producing red blood cells or inadequate amounts of B12 in order for you to stop making red blood cells. So if you wait till the time you have anemia, then you really are going to have a problem. So you can have B12 deficiency. It can even show up low in your serum and, you know, still and be deficient in B12 from other perspectives. So what, again, we're looking at here is do your tissues have enough or their problem showing up as a result of B12 deficiency, even before you actually have anemia. And so I'm saying that, yes, I've seen this and it, it happens quite often. People, you know, don't have anemia, but they still have B12 deficiency. They respond when we give them B12, all their symptoms go away, et cetera. So does that mean you have B12 deficiency? 
Uh, yeah, I would say so. So basically what this is getting at too, in the second one here, you have no macrocytic anemia is the cells are in order for the cells to divide through mitosis, they need enough uh, DNA base pairs. These are things like guanosine, uh, cytosine, et cetera. And if you don't have enough of those, then the basically the cells cannot replicate the DNA within themselves to pass it on to the daughter cell or the next cell. And what is needed to make the DNA base pairs, it is B12 is one of the critical things that are, that's needed to produce those new cells. So if you wait until you have macrocytic anemia, you know, a lot of your tissues will be deficient as well as your red blood cells. Obviously when you're anemic, you don't have enough red blood cells, or you can look at, you know, macrocytosis before you become anemic, anemic, start getting large red blood cells. That does also suggest B12 deficiency. Now there are other reasons that can happen, but you're starting to get at some of the functional ways to look at your blood to see if perhaps you are deficient. So the next one here, serum B12 levels are within the lab's reference range. So whatever your, your local reference range is for your serum B12 levels, you know, if it's normal there, then you don't have a problem with B12. You don't need any more B12. Don't think about it. So that's the myth. And in reality, you know, this reference range here, there's your local lab may have more of a picograms per ML reference range. And so it's going to be a little bit higher. I think it's usually around 300 to, you know, 500 or something like that on the low end. And so in reality, you can have B12 deficiency symptoms or problems at the tissue level, even when you have 500, 600 picograms per ml in your blood. And how do we know that? Well, we do other functional tests that show that there's a problem. Tests that are more sensitive at picking up B12 deficiency from a functional assessment, which we're going to look at here in a second. So basically, yeah, this is a myth because it's going to miss some people that actually have B12 deficiency and need more B12 and benefit uh, is the most important part is they add some of their symptoms or problems are resolved when they start taking B12. Another one here, serum vitamin B12 is only moderately low. So maybe it's, you know, just under the reference range for your lab's reference ranges. And so therefore don't worry about it. Well, I wouldn't, you know, usually if you're low on the reference range, there is a problem there. So, so for similar reasons we already talked about. So methylmalonic acid is is one of the most sensitive ways to look for B12 deficiency. And so you may want to look at this and say, you know, your B12 levels may be low, but your methylmalonic acid is normal. Therefore you don't need any B12 either, since this is a more sensitive way to look at it. Well, you know, th there are different stages that you're going to find someone with B12 deficiency. And just because the methylmalonic acid is low uh, or normal and the, and the serum levels look low, uh, doesn't mean you're not going to, it's not going to develop into high methylmalonic acid later, which is a deficiency sign. And right now you're just seeing it in the serum. So any of these tests being abnormal is a sign of B12 deficiency. And another thing, you know, that sometimes I'll say, well, it only occurs in elderly people. That's, you know, absolutely not true. As you get older, yes, your absorption of B12 does go down and it's more common as you get older, but I posted other videos about how common B12 deficiency is. And yes, it's more common as you get older because of absorption issues and things like that, but it's not unheard of or anything like that. Children can have it as well. And, you know, it's just based, based on how well you absorb it, other things that can be going on. And some of that is genetically determined. So there you go. Those are uh, some B12 deficiency myths for you to think about if you're being tested for B12 deficiency. These are some of the things to uh, keep in mind. And generally, you know, you may do different tests at different times to track your progress with getting your levels up. And I suggest doing that, you know, whatever's, whatever's low in the, the blood tests that you do, then you want to follow that over time to see if it's coming into the normal range, whether it's your red blood cells or methylmalonic acid or actual serum levels. Uh, you want to make sure that what you're doing, if you're swallowing your B12 or doing an injection, is actually getting it into the normal ranges and gives you a better idea of when you need to, you know, pull back on some of that therapeutic treatment, you know, decrease the amount you're taking, et cetera. All right. That should give you a better understanding of what some of the myths are around B12 deficiency testing and how to think about what your B12 levels are. If you do have questions about anything in the video, please drop it in the comment section. I'd be happy to answer your questions and I may do a separate video on that question or topic. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.